In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, good morning. Good to see all of you again this week as we look forward to a very, very warm week coming. So batten down the hatches because here it comes again. It's a few weeks ago I was shopping with Denise and we were in the Target store and I, and I saw something that made me so excited that I took a picture of the item and I sent it to my, my daughter-in-law, or I call my daughter-in-love. What's, what's daughter-in-law? What is that? My daughter-in-love. Love it. But I said, look, Target has garden salsa sun chips, two for four dollars. I was so excited. And she was too, because in a little bit, she texted back and said, I've already got my two bags. Now we all have a nemesis, and food-wise, my nemesis is garden salsa sun chips. If you've never had them, don't. <laughs> for two reasons. It's less for me, and you will become hooked. It's a kind of snack food where I imagine that when that sort of evil scientist created it in a laboratory, kind of hunched over with a white lab coat. They sort of had a, a, a cackle and evil laugh and said things like, I've done it! So garden, salsa, sun chips are my nemesis. A little seven ounce bag. I don't know how many calories are in a single bag. I don't want to know how many calories are in a single bag because I can just eat them. Just go nuts. But as good as they are, and as wonderful and amazing as garden salsa sun chips are, I have to remind myself that they aren't really food. They're not food. Now that's my thing. Maybe your thing is something else. We all have a thing, don't we? Something that we really enjoy eating, kind of a guilty pleasure, but we know in our reasoning mind, not in our belly, that it isn't really food. There's a difference. And this morning's Gospel reading speaks to us about what is really food. And it is important for us to make that distinction. We read this morning in Matthew chapter 14, kind of the middle of a sequence of events that took place in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The first of which in this sequence of events is that Jesus learned that St. John the Baptist had been executed and beheaded by Herod. And that story, of course, we know. And so then in order to have a chance to pray and to reflect, and certainly in his humanity to mourn the loss of his first cousin after the flesh, he withdrew himself to a wilderness. And as we read, of course, there we see that the crowds found him. They discovered him. And so, if we were beginning then to read in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 14, we would read, Now when Jesus heard it, heard the news of St. John the Baptist's execution, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place by himself, where the multitudes heard of this, and they followed him on foot from the cities. So many that there were 5,000 men plus their wives and their children. And the story you know because you just heard. It's lonely, it's desolate, they're in the wilderness, they've been there all day with the Lord listening to His divine words, eating that spiritual food, if you will, and then towards evening they realize that they've not had lunch, they've not had dinner, and they're hungry. And so the disciples, as we know, come to Jesus and say, Lord, send them away to get some food into the villages nearby. And as we heard last week in the homily from 2 Kings of the four lepers in the besieged city of Samaria, who after the Lord God Almighty drove away the armies of Ben-Hadad and the Syrians, wandered into the enemy encampment and there discovered all of this food. And we talked about the fact that they went back into the city to share that food. So too must we who know where to find a decent meal, share that news with others. And so the Lord says to His disciples, you don't need to send them away, you give them some food. 
Now the rest of the story, of course, we know. Five little barley loaves and two dried fish. You can always count on a mom to pack a lunch for her kid, right? <clears throat> and little did she know as she's packing that lunch that through the grace of God that it would feed so many. But there's a continuation of this story that we also need to know. Because after this, Jesus withdrew himself again and crossed the Sea of Galilee and went away from them again, teaching but then needing a little space. And we pick up this thread, if you will, with me in John chapter 6. Now John chapter 6 is a very interesting chapter in the New Testament for two reasons. One, it is the longest chapter in the New Testament. And the second, it is the only chapter in the New Testament that Bible literalists will not take literally. Many Christians will say everything is absolutely the inspired word of God, but John chapter 6, maybe not so much. And you'll see why here in a minute. And so the crowds follow Christ. They find him again. They're looking for another free meal. And he even calls them out and says, you're only coming to me again because I fed you in the wilderness. And this is what he says then, in John chapter 6, beginning then in verse 26. He says, Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to, for eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you, for on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. And again they ask him, verse 28, they said therefore to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And then of course the argument starts between the professional religious guise of Jesus' day and the Lord of glory, the King of kings, standing right in front of them that they did not recognize. And so they said, therefore, to him, What then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? So I guess the 5,000 being fed in the wilderness from two dried fish and five loaves wasn't enough. And they continue and say, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. You might recall from Sunday school or in your Bible reading, I so hope you're reading your Bible that the children of Israel, wandering for 40 years in the desert of Sinai, out of Egypt, on the way to Cana, that promised land, were given divine food from God, a type of sweet bread that fell with the morning dew out of the heavens. And so they ate that bread for 40 years and were satisfied. And so the Jews are saying to the Lord, well, we know that God fed us, but what about you? And this is what the Lord said. Verse 32, Jesus therefore said to him, Truly, truly I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And they said therefore to him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And this is where people get a little sketchy about John chapter 6. And let's be honest, this is where very many people who sit in Orthodox parishes across America and the world today get a little sketchy about what Jesus Christ himself plainly said, not once, but three times in this chapter. And this is what he said. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Just like that. I am the bread of life. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. And he continues speaking with those who are questioning him about who he is and the food that he has to give. Verse 41, the Jews therefore were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? And Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Truly I say to you, he who believes 
in me has everlasting life. And then in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is a bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Teaching us as he's teaching them about the Holy Eucharist. About consuming the body and blood of Christ. About being united to God through his son Jesus Christ and the Holy Mysteries. As he's going to inaugurate on the Thursday of Holy Week in the Mystical Supper. Ah, but the argument isn't over. And the Jews therefore began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then verse 53, Jesus answered again and says, Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he shall also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of the heavens, not as the fathers ate and died, for he who eats this bread shall live forever. Longest chapter in the New Testament. So important that Jesus repeats himself twice over to make certain that we get the point and understand what is and is not real food. But just like in our physical bodies, we'd rather have a bag of garden salsa, sun chips, or whatever it might be for you. In our spiritual lives, we sort of go looking for junk food, don't we? You know, the worst sort of eating you can do is what's called grazing. You ever graze? Oh, believe me, you've grazed, right? Grazing is this. I have a really bad habit. I can go all through the day from breakfast until dinner, right? Not eating. I get busy. I skip meals all the time. And so I go home. And dinner maybe isn't quite ready yet. So I'm just going to have a little something. Just a little sun chips. Maybe, and then maybe a, a couple cookies. That's all. I'm going to spoil my dinner, you know? And then there's some M&Ms up in the cupboards. Just, just a few M&Ms, not, not too many. You know, and then I think, oh, there's some cheese. And it's free. you know what, I've had like 5,000 calories of junk. Right? And then dinner comes and I'm not hungry. I wonder why. Because of all this like toxic sludge of various types of bizarre foods. You know, in me. And it's the same way in our spiritual lives. Not being truly nourished. Not being really fed. Not coming to the service not receiving the Holy Eucharist, staying away from the chalice for a long time because we're not living in grace. We haven't been to confession for a very long time. We don't keep the prescribed fast. We don't prepare ourselves to receive. So what do we do? We graze, right? A little of this and a little of that. We go off into the hedges, you know? Maybe a little Buddhism here. Maybe a little shamanism there. Maybe a little New Age over here. Maybe there's a yogi that I like and listen to him for a while. Maybe I'll listen to a TV preacher because he tells me that I should be rich and that's great. You know, or maybe I get in a league with a political point of view or an economic theory or I follow a sports team or I do whatever vacuous nonsense that I can think of grazing spiritually because I'm not really feeding myself. And so we find ourselves then what? Hungry. We find ourselves perpetually hungry. There is a table set for us where we can come and eat, but we don't. And so we find ourselves starving, just as the prophet Amos prophesied and promised that that day, that this day would come. This is what the prophet Amos says. He says, Behold, the days are coming. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, declares the Lord God that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. And people will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. And they will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and they will not find it. Beloved, are we not in that place today? 
where our children, our grandchildren, don't hear the word of the Lord? How can they hear if they don't come? Do we have these conversations over the dinner table? Do we have a dinner table? Do we eat dinner together? Or do we sit in our various little cubicles with a device in our head like this, seeing what's going on in the world and not really even communicating with one another, right? So there is a famine in the world today of hearing the words of God, of being well and truly nourished. And so what do we do? We go and try to find every which way that we can to deal with that gnawing hunger inside of us that only union with God can address. We have to have the right car. We have to live in the right zip code. We have to have the right kind of a house. It has to be properly furnished. We have to be seen on Saturday nights in the right kind of restaurants, in the company of the right kind of people. So we can take a picture of ourselves on Instagram and show everyone that we're okay. Right? Starving to death all the time. And so we waste ourselves. We expend ourselves on things that aren't real food. But there's good news. Our palate can be fixed. Many years ago, I was traveling back from Greece, and I was jet-lagged and running through JFK Airport and trying to decide if I could make my flight. And so I thought, well, I'm not really hungry, so I'd like the worst thing possible. I grabbed a Coca-Cola off of the kiosk, not having had any junk food in Greece for a month because Greece is really cool that way, you know? And so I'm running along, and I crack it open, and ah, it's like gravy. It, it, it's like syrup. It, it's so thick and disgusting. So I sealed it up and threw it away because my palate had been cured of the need for that kind of nonsense. When it lose a little weight, dump the pop. It'll happen so easily. You ever gone off of junk food? Doritos, sun chips, potato chips, candy, cookies? And then you go back and have it again and your stomach starts to roll? Oh, this, this isn't, I used to like this, right? Because our palate can be cleansed. We can be healed of a desire to eat junk food. Just as spiritually, we can be healed of a desire to eat junk food. Wrapping up this morning, the prophet Isaiah speaks to us about the banquet that is available to us. At the end of his very beautiful and long and, and challenging work. So challenging, in fact, that they sawed him in half when he got done writing it. This is what Isaiah says. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Beloved, that can happen here for us and in fact does happen here for us every time the Divine Liturgy is celebrated. We are invited to eat real food. The body and blood of Christ, without which, as He Himself told us, we have and can have no life within us unless we eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man in the Holy Eucharist. We dare not allow ourselves to go hungry one more day, not when sustenance is available here for us now. So let us commit ourselves then to feeding ourselves to get off of all the junk food, the spiritual junk food, the physical junk food, and really eat the food that God has given us.